Hello, welcome back to Straightforward, Levant TV's political talk show. This week marks 10 years since the 7-7 bombings, which saw 52 people killed on London's tube and bus network. July the 7th, 2005 started off as a day of celebration, where London had just won its bid to host the 2012 Olympics, using Britain's celebrated multicultural society as its biggest draw. But it took only four young Al-Qaeda suicide bombers, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, Shizad Tanweer, Hasib Hussein, and Jermaine Lindsay, only four, soon brought the nation to a stop. Today, in the streets of Britain, thousands of them march freely, calling for jihad. The Islamic State flag has been flown on estates in East London last summer, and this week, a father and daughter walks blatantly with, with, with their ISIS flag around the Houses of Parliament in Westminster. How did this affect Britain's stance on radical Islam? How did the Muslim community develop since the attacks? What is Britain's security like now that jihadi Muslims, supposedly British, are returning from Syria with the potential to initiate terror here on UK soil? And 10 years later, what did Britain learn from the tragedy? Let me first mention that today also marks a complete underground transport strike in London, which has caused a rather more peaceful type of havoc in the city. Hence, I will not be hosting any guests in the studio, but will be hosting them via Skype or the telephone. But before we get into welcoming our guests today, let's have a look at this brief no-comment report on the 7 terror attacks. Underground network has been closed after an explosion at Oldgate Underground Station in the east of the city. King's Cross and Liverpool Street have been evacuated. So all I remember is her saying was, Sugar, I'm on my way. Now I can't stand up here as many have done before and say that the London bombings has had an effect on me that has changed my life positively. Sometimes I feel that people are so hell-bent on trying to make a point about terrorism not breaking us that they forget about all the people that got caught up in it. Not for my sake, but for those who were killed on that day and their families. They're the people we're here today to remember. May we never forget. Some dramatic footage there indeed. Let's start now by talking to British political commentator Mr. William Spring joining us over the phone from London. Welcome to Straightforward Levant TV. Good afternoon. Mr. Spring, what are your impressions of Britain 10 years on the 7-7 attacks? Um, well, it's a country, UK, it's a country which unfortunately has never uh, looked at the reality of the situation. Um, it was very obvious from the moment that the uh, British troops went into Iraq that we were laying ourselves open to this type of terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tony Blair was precisely warned about this, um, that he was leaving the situation open. And uh, nothing was done, and the result was that the 7-7 um, happened. Now we've got another crisis in following the Tunisian um, massacre, mm -hmm. which was entirely predictable uh, because we left the country after David Cameron's bizarre attempt to introduce democracy, as he called it, into uh, Tunisia. Yes. He left the country in a complete shambles. But before we get into politics, Mr. Spring, uh, Britain in general nowadays 
does it really feel the same when it comes to the sometimes intimidating marches when you see radical um, Muslims, what, what is referred to as radical Islam, in the country doing marches calling for Sharia law for Britain and so on? Well, no, I mean, I, I think that um, the uh, Muslim population generally are not in favor of this anyway, but these guys who go around unveiling ISIS flags outside the House of Commons and things like that, they are provoking a very considerable backlash against their own policies and positions uh, in view of the well-known barbarity of ISIS mm -hmm. or ISIL. Yes. Um, you know, we really are in a, in a, we're in a very bad way that the police for example, seem to think that this is quite legal. Yes, and as a Briton, Mr. Spring, are you concerned about the generations to come when it comes to the demographic change in, in London, in Leeds, in Birmingham, let's say it's clearly, where supposedly there is a growth of r radical or even Islamist uh, thought or rhetoric in those regions we see it is thriving. Now, what do you think of this? Is it alarming for you? Very alarming. In view of in view of what has happened to minorities, and I mean minorities, I'm not. I'm not I, I actually am talking here about Christians who are not a minority in, Gre in Great Britain as such, although they may well become a minority. But what's happened overseas in different countries around the world, where um, these radical radical hotheads have gain ground is a policy of persecution of all groups which are not conforming to their agenda. Mm. Now stay they, with, yes, yeah? yes, stay with us, Mr. Spring, as we now welcome Mr. Imran Shah joining us via Skype from East London. Mr. Shah, welcome to our discussion today. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, Mr. Shah, uh, so uh, Joseph Willits writes on the occasion of 7-7, he writes in the IB Times that Quote, we haven't learned much here in Britain. We must ensure that Muslim communities become and are welcomed more into the fabric of British life, rather than allowing further alienation in a vicious climate where far-right attitudes as well as hardline Muslim views are on the rise. What is your point of view on this? Yeah, I mean, I would certainly echo that. We have a situation where the backlash of uh, foreign wars is turning into uh, terrorism uh, as like 7-7 seven, seven. and as a consequence you see Cameron and Tony Blair especially on 7-7 seven, seven anniversary saying that things like foreign policy we can't discuss that and if you do discuss that in relation to terrorism then you are essentially uh, an apologizer or sympathizer for terrorism itself so for Cameron and the, the British elites it's, it's almost like foreign policy is the golden calf for them and if you ever were to talk about that uh, the the root cause of such things, then essentially you have to be shut down. As a consequence of this, what this does is that it, it alienates uh, and marginalises Muslim communities who who want to solve the issue of foreign policy through peaceful democratic means. And when you see the demonisation of Muslim activists such as Mozambique, um, who are is who consistently harassed and persecuted by the security services, never been charged on any grounds whatsoever. When you see like that stuff like that happening, then especially with the youth, you have a situation where, you know, what what is, well, you have a situation where the country. Is is saying two things. One, I, I can't make peaceful change for the issues that I'm angry about. And two is that you're actually demonizing me as a Muslim. You're making me feel unwelcome here. You are severing the, you're creating a, a legislating policies and issues that make me more on uh, mm. more unequal in the state and also the rhetoric that sort of uh, in counter-terrorism is the exact same rhetoric of far right white, uh, white supremacist extremists so yes. you have essentially legislative policies that are essentially amplifying and and uh, radicalizing people in both extremes so stay with us uh, mr mr shah uh, mr spring back to you is it acceptable when some islamist sympathizers sort of argue that right-wing or British nationalist thought in the country is the reason or indirect reason behind violent retaliation here on UK soil? No, I, I think violent retaliation of any kind is, is, 
reprehensible is not to be um, apologised for or endorsed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that people who come to this country have to recognise that they are certainly uh, guest, um, guests in the country. Even and when they are British, when they become citizens? Yes, I, mean, I think even when you become a citizen, you're still required to be on good behaviour, as it were. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many things wrong with um, British society, mm. and there are many things wrong with foreign policy. Uh, and it is frustrating that when people try to protest peacefully, the government, or the regime, I prefer to call it, takes not the slightest amount of notice. Um, so I can understand people getting very angry, upset, and thinking that violence will be a shortcut to getting their way. But of course it won't. All it will do is encourage their opponents. Yes. Uh, and back to you, Mr. Imran Khan. Uh, we see some comments on social media where British Muslims sort of dissociate when it comes to extreme radical rhetoric like that of uh, Anjum Chowdhury. Where do you stand? You have to appreciate essentially where the anger is coming from. And whilst we all should sort of recognise that violence is by no means uh, a me uh, should be a means to any sort of aim, you have to appreciate where, where that rhetoric is coming from. And you know the 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 power of extremist preachers would be absolutely nullified if the government was able to engage with Muslims, especially on issues of foreign policy, because then we can actually look at our foreign policy uh, in that ethical ways in which we can engage. Around the world instead of selling arms to dictators who who occupy Muslim countries that also get the the political support uh, um, from from many Western countries including Britain you know CC who <laughs> was uh, invited to Britain only a few weeks ago mm. you know this this sort of behavior just makes Muslims angry it makes many people angry as well yeah um, but angry you see angry is something and retaliation is something else taking to yeah, the and, street and that's calling for yeah. Sharia law in Britain and calling well, that, that, well, you know, if you're looking at the actual number of people that stand on street corners and call for the caliphate, they are literally 20 in number in London and very few across the UK. Yes. The vast majority. So, you know, the, there are hundreds, if not, no, there's definitely thousands of white supremacists going up and down the country in coaches saying that we need to chuck the Muslims outside of the UK or kill them all. That's that's a real prospect. Uh, that's far more of an issue than we have with Islamic extremism. But so, then, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shah, only four on 7-7-2005, only four very young men mm. caused the nation to stop at that moment when they bombed the underground yeah. and the bus networks. Yeah, and definitely, and that has to be taken into account. But let's not forget that the reason why this is happening is essentially a blowback from, from the, the foreign world. Do you, like do you condemn many, the acts, uh, Mr. Shah? Just, just let's, need, let's be clear. I shouldn't, I shouldn't need to condemn to try and explain what I'm saying. I mean, condoning doesn't do anything. All it does is, is appease uh, an, emo uh, an emotional response. If we really, and it doesn't act, actually have any pragmatic value in condemning. So, you know, me, I, I'm sick and tired of condemning mm. simply because it doesn't actually add to any value whatsoever. Mm. In, in fact, it's used as a weapon uh, against the Muslim community to say that this is your problem. When it's not, it's the government's problem. Stay with us, uh, Mr. Shah. Mr. Spring, what's your final say? Basically, I think the policies of the government on foreign policy have been disgraceful. Um, and um, we, sh we should all condemn Tony Blair and his successors for their creation. What about, of what about the, 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 the terrorists who, who, who caused the havoc? And, well, and that's equally to be condemned. Hmm. I mean, whether we're killing people in Baghdad or terrorists are killing people in London, it seems to me the same sort of equation. But uh, the violence, Baghdad is a is state of war, Mr. Spring. Pardon? Just to clarify, Baghdad wouldn't be considered as, as a state of war while bombing uh, uh, the tubes or the bus network in, in, when there's no war here in Britain. That's terrorism. Well, no, there was, it was a war in Baghdad, in Iraq and mm. in Libya. Um, it was an act of war by the British government on mm. sovereign states without any reference to the United Nations. Totally illegal.
And this is what the government now wants to do again in mm. Syria, having yes. been voted down once in the House of Commons. Mm. Mm. Mr. Now, William Spring, writer and political commentator. Sorry, we'll have to leave it there due to time constraints. Joined us over the phone from London. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. And now we are joined by the Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson, joining us from Los Angeles in California. Welcome to our discussion today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Now, 10 years on the terror attacks in London, what are your impressions about what you consider, I guess, a lot of tolerance towards uh, extreme rhetoric in the West? Uh, political correctness gone wild. Uh, a great attempt to appease the enemies, which is our enemies, which is only bringing out the worst in them. Anytime you don't deal with your enemies straight up uh, at, with, with authority and power, you empower them to overtake you eventually, and that is what's happening, and I'm very concerned about it. Yes, and do you think what's happening here in the streets of London uh, is acceptable when it comes to promoting a caliphate in, in the West, in Europe in general, and London particularly? People are carrying the ISIS flag near the Houses of Parliament. Would this be acceptable in the United States? You know, at one point I would have said no, this would not be acceptable, and I, by the people, no, it would not be acceptable. But by our president, Barack Obama, who is demonstrate, who has demonstrated and is demonstrating that he will do nothing to protect the American citizens, but he is so, seemed to be supporting our enemies. And I think if that should come about in this country, it would be because he have, uh, he would allow it in order to appease our enemies somehow or another thinking that they won't hurt us if we go along with them. So it is possible under Barack Obama. Uh -huh. And uh, Reverend Peterson, you mentioned enemies. Are you talking here about radical Muslims? Yes. Okay, radical let me put you through to our other guests here from London. Uh, Mr. Imran Shah, based in East London, he's with us over the phone. So can you try to explain to him what you mean by enemies and how, how is radical Islam the enemy? One thing for sure, without a doubt, in anyone's mind, uh, the radical Muslims want to destroy the Christians and Jews. They hate us, they think that we are infidels, and they would deceive us and destroy us by any means necessary. These people are on the side of evil, they are not standing for good at all, and they have a desire to conquer the, to, uh, to, uh, conquer the world all in the name of so-called Allah. Yes. That's not good and we should not agree with or go along with it. Mr. Imran Shah, what do you have to say? Yeah, I, I largely agree. I mean, but what has to be understood is this is just part of the puzzle. You ha uh, the, the, uh, what, is, what is known as Islamic State already was essentially ex bafis party members that, that essentially Saddam Hussein's party who essentially formed ISIS very later on. And when they formed this militia, it literally was the time when America and its allies said this, this mission accomplished. And we have to also understand as well that during the occupation of Iraq, that General Petraeus, and this has been exposed by the Channel 4 and various other sort of channels, that General Petraeus actually engineered a situation where it caused hyper-sectarianism. So what you have as, as a result, you have American foreign policy, which is not just simply trying to uh, dominate, but also create situations in which causes chaos for decades, and if not mm -hmm. um, centuries later on. And that's exactly what we see from the British Empire during sykes Peak as well. Mm, what about the infidel uh, notion that Reverend Peterson mentioned? You, you, I've not hosted any uh, sort of uh, extreme or maybe, uh, you know, radical scholar, Muslim scholar, who didn't say that in Islam there's no such thing as ethnic or white or black or, or whatever. There's Muslim or Kafir, which means infidel. So do you differ with, with people who say that? No, um I mean, Gaffer means non-believer, and that's um, and what 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 people generally use that for as just simply as a as as a way to. But we believe in God. I'm not Muslim, and I believe in God as well. So why would you? Yeah, consider yeah, but, but, uh, me? Essentially, essentially, it means someone who believes doesn't believe in Islam. That's cool. But what extremist people tend to do is use that as a form of a derogatory word, mm -hmm. and and that's how they sort of use it. The issue of infidel and and sort of general religious 
zealotness is that is, is, is essentially it's used by all sorts of religious zealots uh, uh, to essentially say that they're more superior than those other religious people over there. And, and this is despite those very same religions saying, no, actually mm. you're all in, equal under God. And, mm. and th- 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 there is no issue here. We know that there are extremists as well as white supremacists yes. who are evangelicals in America as well. We know that there are extremist lines in, in, in Israel and elsewhere in the world. It's, but it's speaking of extremism, you know. back to you, Reverend Peterson. Uh, Mr. Shah mentioned that he links things a little bit to foreign policy be it in Iraq or, uh, or, or other countries in the Middle East. Now, obviously, for example, Palestine is considered as an occupied territory in the Middle East. Yet here in Britain, for example, we see activism and lobbying going on in a peaceful manner. Yet at the same time, when it comes to like what Mr. Shah just said, in the Middle East, in the Arab part of the Middle East, uh, when when a, the Asian ethnic community, Muslim community in England is not happy with it, then they sort of justify violence and retaliation by the use of violence, be it on UK soil or otherwise. Um, so w- do you think that lobbying would be a more successful um, solution? Uh, no, these people don't want peace. The, the uh, radical Islam is not for peace, they're for conquering. And you can't lobby your enemy, you have to destroy your enemies. And unless you destroy them, they will destroy you. And if you notice, all across the uh, different parts of the country today, they are destroying, they're not trying to make peace with anyone. They are recruiting, and I don't care what anyone says, they do see us as infidels, they do see the Jews uh, as uh, infidels, and they see Israel as a small uh, 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 Satan and America as a big Satan, and their whole mission, their entire mission, is to conquer both. It's not about peace. This religion is not about a peaceful religion. Mm -hmm. If so, you would see more Muslims across the world coming out and and, uh, joining the Westerners in in an attempt to Mm -hmm. defeat radical Islam, Mm -hmm. but you do not see that happening and until we see that happening, we have to assume that they're supporting the ideas of radical Islam. Maybe they're not as evil, but there are aspects of radical Islam that these people are supporting. Mm-hmm. Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson, thank you very much for joining us, uh, founder and president of bondaction.org. Thank you very much. Nice talking to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. Shah. Uh, what do you have to say about those sort of uh, harsh comments, I must say? Um, well, you have a situation, this is exactly the type of rhetoric you have from Islamophobes. You say they actually don't acknowledge in any way that how foreign wars are connected to the general sort of demise of and destroying of states, which, which is, would they certainly fund, like, uh, you know, they, we know that America did fund the Al-Nusra Front in Syria, and mm. we also know that the CIA, through the Libyan Embassy, also fund, funded Boko Haram. So, you know, at least in, in the very initial stages. So you have this sort of two-sided, two-faced sort of scenario where they blame the um, sort of the people that they oppress on some sort of ideology, but then themselves in a pragmatic scenario, they actually help engineer the situation. So when when Islamophobes essentially say that, well, the onus is on Muslims, well, no, actually it's not, because the vast majority of Muslims just want to get on with their lives in a very peaceful state. We also have on a, on a almost yes. daily basis in the UK that, you know, they do come down, they do apologize, but still this onus is still put on the Muslims mm. and you have to take more ownership. What is it that can normal people do that whole nations and states actually do around yes. the world and also in the country? Mm. There's a complete disparity and, you know, it's, it's, it's hypocrisy really. And now we are joined by Paul Perrin, British political activist and commentator, talking to us from Brighton. Welcome to Straightforward Levant TV. Hello there, nice to be here. Mr. Perrin, uh, what has changed 10 years after 7 7 terror attacks in Britain? What has changed since then? Um, I, I think, to a great extent, not much has. Um, I think one of the, the sort of typical British reaction to this kind of thing is just stoicism. Uh, you know, the British, they don't, they don't panic. They don't uh, get mad about things. I think with the, with the 7-7 uh, anniversary coming up, uh, or it's just passed, obviously all the people 
everyone in the country sort of feels sympathy for people who lost uh, people uh, in the event. But overall, as far as the actual calls of the terrorists, I think really that see, that's pretty relevant to everyone. Mm-hmm. It's just a, a human reaction. I think if you think about uh, what, what happened in London, it wasn't that long ago that we had the RA bombs going off. I, I was working in London at the time. Mm-hmm. I was working in the Aldrich in central London about the time that uh, a, bump, a bomb went off on a bus there. I worked in Docklands mm-hmm. about the time that there was a huge bomb there. Um, I lived in South London and uh, they found an RA bomb factory around the corner. Yes. But that's all in the past now and who, who cares about who really cares about the RA? But that's where my second question. Many argue no lessons were learned and Britons feel more alienated in their own country nowadays. Do you agree? Sorry, could you just repeat the question? I said many mere feel uh, that lessons weren't really learned from the 7-7 attacks and British people feel more alienated in their own country nowadays. Um, I think that... I don't think people in the country feel alienated. What, in my experience, as I say, the actual cause that the terrorists were working for, people aren't really that interested in. Um, and but the, what, the impact it has had on the public, the most uh, c- complaints and issues I hear, is actually about the government's response. Um, people are very annoyed at all the extra security airports. Mm-hmm. It looked very much like the government were just um, posing. They were trying to put on a big face. And um, the public generally thought that the te- that's, if the terrorists had an impact, it was the government's reaction. It wasn't what the terrorists themselves had done. Mm. Uh, stay with us, Mr. Perrin. Uh, Mr. Imran Shah, back to you. Uh, do you think that the marches in London, uh, the marches calling for Sharia law and all, all that sort of rhetoric, uh, does it not intimidate the local British community? It only intimidates them when essentially that the press in the UK and the likes of uh, you know white supremacist groups amplify their voice for their own means. Uh, really, these people have really got no attention before um, newspapers started to become much more um, uh, agenda focused in terms of trying to amplify the extremist voice. So the likes of the Daily Mail, the likes of the Express, very sensationalist mm. newspapers, really nobody t- cared about them, nobody cared about them in the 90s, Muslim communities largely didn't know about them or cared about them and, and neither did the, the non-Muslim wider public as well. Mm. So um, it, it's, it's, it's really just um, uh, trying to fear uh, amplify these people and also at the same time uh, sideline mainstream Muslim voices, especially those who do have political concerns about rising Islamophobia um, and foreign policy, so that it creates a, a, a sort of like a, a, a stage sort of like the, it is either our government people that are essentially supporting our counterterrorism or extremists like Andrew Chowdhury who oppose it. And the but do Muslims, you condemn? Do you condemn what he what he what he calls for, Andrew Chowdhury? Well, I, I don't like the guy. I don't like what he says. You know, I don't I don't see the point of condemning him because that doesn't do anything at all. But why? Um, why he does represent a huge share of the Muslim. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. If you look at the, the marches that he leads in Luton and elsewhere in central London, um, well, like yeah, I said, I mean, it takes only a little God, group to cause so much havoc. Yeah, and that's what they are, a very little group. Like I said, it, it is the likes of The Sun, The Daily Mail, right uh, papers who essentially amplify their voice. And at the same time, you don't see the vast majority of Muslims doing uh, helping out food bank. You don't see the masjids in the, in the UK you... uh, helping with charity drive. You don't mm. see all the sort of good news that British Muslims actually do. The only time you do see it is in local community papers, but you don't see it in the national press at all. And, and that's the thing, you have a situation, probably the reason why you know, that sort of highlights your question. It, it seems like Antrim Charge and the likes have a big following. They don't really. And and, and the marginalisation of the, the mainstream Muslim voice essentially uh, adds to the, that atmosphere of, mm-hmm. of uh, fear and ignorance. Where do you differ, Mr Shah, when it comes to uh, those marches and the, their, their aims, basically? Do you call for Sharia in the UK? No, I don't particularly Not don't. even for the Muslim community? Well, I mean, the, the 
because the way in Britain works, you are allowed, just like the Jewish community, to have your own rights of religious uh, mm. expression. So you know, there isn't an issue in terms of um, being able to you know, practice your faith in, in, in the guidelines that you need to. There, there isn't any no, issue No, practicing, I'm not talking about practicing faith, well, of course, but well, when I'm, it comes to Sharia courts, for example, and their their, their uh, stance on women's rights, for example. Now here in the UK, obviously it's a multicultural fabric, but yeah. should, should women be part of uh, the, the compromise here, for example? Well, that's entirely up, up to them. I mean... In, on UK <laughs> soil, it's up to who? Well, let me answer the question. So you have a situation where Sharia courts, just like Jewish courts, are entirely voluntary. You also have a situation where they, they are enti entirely under the pin of UK sovereign law. But also at the same time, there is that per uh, perception that you know women lose out in these Sharia courts. Actually, it's a lot easier for them. Uh, I'm talking from feedback from personal uh, you know, uh, women, Muslim women of mine, and also they get get more gains from it because you know the, there is always an onus from from the husband to always provide for the the uh, you know children or for them afterwards. But you can know, so, also have another wife, so obviously that yeah. sort of could encourage a little bit of polygamy there in in Britain. So yeah, so I don't know where's the thin line there. Would you define it? Well, you have to also work within the lines of, of the UK law. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you also have to respect that. But it, the issue that they are somehow sort of imposing Sharia law or, or by supporting them is somehow imposing Sharia law. It's anonymous to say, like, you know, by supporting the, the Jewish uh, religious councils is by trying to say that these courts are there to, to impose Jewish law. It's, it's, it's absurd. And the reason why we don't hear of Jewish um, uh, of course, it's because it's anti-Semitic in the same way that the same the reason that issue is Islamophobic. Mm. Thank you very much, Mr. Imran Shah. Nice talking to you. you. Joined us from East London today. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Mr. Back to you in in Brighton, Ms. Pirin. How can we link this to the European stance in general when it comes to its tolerance to radical Islam, and has this affected Britain eventually? Um, I think here in the UK we don't actually have that clear a picture of what's happening in Europe. Um, we are a bit detached from the sort of EU um, and our papers don't really cover, um, cover European issues much. Where we get most of our information from is actually generally from the internet. Mm -hmm. um, as far as sort of Islam in Europe, I mean the most, the, uh, the uh, most worrying thing I've heard about is actually um, the rape rate in Sweden, mm. where apparently, according to some sites, up to 68 or 70 percent of rapes in Sweden uh, are by migrants. Mm. Uh, now, I've, I've tried to substantiate these figures to actually look into it, um, and there are quite a few sites, and admittedly some of them are sort of far right, but you have to go to research where the information is, mm. who are pushing this figure. But looking for people, looking for the other side of the argument, all I can find is people who haven't actually got any different figures. They just say that the figures that are given, this 6870, are being used incorrectly. But they don't actually offer any alternative. Yes. I found on the BBC website, they, because Julian Assange, mm -hmm. he was accused of rape. Mm -hmm. or, in fact, it wasn't very, uh, it's... it's um, it's a sex, sexual offence mm. that they, they want to question him over. Mm -hmm. So he hasn't actually been arrested or charged, etc. But one thing that did come out of it is the very high um, rate of reported rapes in Sweden. Mm. And what the BBC, when they noticed this figure was high and it was being questioned, the BBC did do a piece on it, but they didn't actually look at how many rapes there were and who they were by. Mm. They, again, just looked at the statistic and said, this statistic that's being used um, shouldn't be used in this way. Mm -hmm. So there's mm. still no figure for um, whether, whether um, migrants in Sweden are a huge problem. That could but be perhaps the BBC's uh, sometimes excessive political correctness. Uh, my next question, uh, while Britain is at higher security threat today than it was in 2005, some suggest that we need to inspire Muslims who feel alienated in the UK so that they develop a sense of belonging to Britain. But do you think it shouldn't be the other way around? Where, um, where they should inspire uh, the British community to sort of buy into what they believe in? Well, I think what's happened to 
in the views philosophy people in the UK is um, years ago we were sold this idea of multiculturalism being a wonderful way of things working. But all we seem to have ended up is with um, individual areas, cities and towns being taken over by different communities. Mm. So there is no integration. And I think really what people are starting to think now is we've had that experiment and it hasn't worked. Um, uh, we. Yes, Mr. Perrin, I had just addressed um, Mr. Shah previously and uh, Reverend P Jesse Lee Peterson, who was with us from Los Angeles. We spoke about the way they retaliate or the way they react to, say, foreign policy in Iraq and Syria and so on. Now, for example, Palestine is considered an occupied state, and yet what we see here in Britain is lobbying a bit of demonstrations and things. They don't call for Sharia law in, in the UK. They don't call for a caliphate in the UK. They don't go around and cause uh, terror threats or any sort of intimidation. Now, what do you have to say about, for example, let's say clearly the ethnic minorities in the UK, the Asian Muslim ethnic minorities, who believe that just because a Muslim was oppressed from an Israeli in the Middle East or any other uh, side in the Middle East, then they have the right to justify terror acts here in England. I don't, I don't think there's uh, any British people who, who would actually see that any terrorist act in the UK is justified. Um, what we do have in the UK is there's quite a strong um, far left movement who basically like to jump on any bandwagon that's going. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll, if, if there's an issue, um, they'll, they'll adopt it. We get quite a few issues um, from, from the States. I mean, in the, again, in America, you've got the black and white racism problems. They don't actually exist in the UK. But lots of people at universities, they, uh, particularly to the left, left wing oriented students, they see what's going on over there and they just as adopt American issues lock, stock, and barrel. Mm. So again, with the Palestinian um, and Israeli issue, there's people who are just jumping on that because that's something that separates the left and the right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as the rights and the wrongs, um, as the rights and wrongs, people are far far less interested in the detail mm -hmm. than it's a, an issue that they can say, this is left wing, this defines me, that's mm -hmm. right wing, I object mm -hmm. to that, and that mm -hmm. defines them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mr. Paul Perrin, British political activist and commentator, spoke to us from Brighton. Thank you very much for your contribution today. Thank you. And now we are joined by writer and political analyst Anthony Sykes. Welcome to our discussion. It's, uh, it's very nice to be on. Um, obviously, you've introduced me there as Anthony Sykes, but that's actually a pseudonym. Um, and I could talk a little bit about the reason I use that pseudonym, if you like, because it, really, it relates to what we're discussing. But... Uh, I'll leave that up to you. Of course, of course, we will, we will get to that, obviously, especially when I ask the questions. Okay. Mr. Sykes, is multiculturalism the problem in Britain, or as you might argue, it's in fact Islamic doctrine? Well, you see, now we're speaking two days after the 10th anniversary of the 7-7 attacks, of course. Mm -hmm. um, now, in the couple of years preceding 7-7, um, we started to hear people say, sort of, dare to say for the first time, you know, or talk in terms of there having been a failure of multiculturalism in the UK. Now, naturally, in the wake of 7-7, when four British citizens, basically in the name of jihad, you know, blew up 52 of their fellow Britons, um, that talk became more prevalent. And I, I agree with it at the time, but o over the years since, I would say that my opinions become more nuanced. I, I don't think the, the problem, as you allude to, is with multiculturalism per se, since, you know, the vast majority of non-indigenous ethno-religious groups to settle in Britain in the post-war era, they've done so with success, they've done so without major trouble. It's not been perfect by any means, it could have been better, but it's gone pretty well. Now, there's been one notable exception to that, and that, I'm afraid to say, is the Muslim community. Now, this certainly isn't true for all of the Muslim community, far from it, but I do feel that it's not multiculturalism that has failed, but it's, it's Islam in Britain that is, is failing multiculturalism, and I think that is because... You know, Islam, mainstream Islam at least, and particularly Sunni Islam as a belief system, I think in many ways it's incompatible with a multicultural society where so you know, it's the integration. Let, let ethos is key. I think it's you know, an inherently supremacist and expansionist doctrine in some ways, and it's not terribly tolerant, and it promotes disdain for the disbelievers. You know, it's not very malleable, but you know, we could list examples of that, but you know, I'm sure you want to come in again. No, but what's, what's, your, what's so controversial about this that you wouldn't want your picture to be seen or your real name to be... Right, well, you see, as I said, you've introduced me as Anthony Sykes, and as I said, that's a pseudonym. Now, the reason I use that pseudonym is, sadly, we've 
We've seen a number of instances in which anyone who speaks about Islam in a manner which is anything other than un anything less than uncritical, they receive. Firstly, they're, they're liable to receive threats in some cases from militant Muslims, threats of violence, threats of death. Sometimes it's threats toward the family, and sadly, in in some cases, you know, these these people have made good on their threats, and people have lost their lives. <laughs> Secondly, and this is a more immediate concern to someone like myself, there's a very pervasive and very oppressive taboo in the West, and certainly in the UK, with regard to any comment upon Islam, which is anything other than, you know, obsequious praise. Because, because of what I would say is a deliberate attempt and a malicious attempt driven by both the far left and, and the Muslim far right to dismiss any critical opinion or even any kind of scrutiny or questioning relating to Islam as racism. And this can have, a, you know, detrimental consequences for a person in terms of their career and even socially. So for the reasons I've said, you know, if I were to acquire a high profile as someone talking about this subject, I wouldn't want to do it with a name that's on the electoral roll. And I think that in, it, in itself underlines what a volatile subject this is and how difficult it is to be honest. Uh, why, why, uh, why has it, it, it seems to, to, to many people and myself that sometimes Islam is being sold as a package at the universities, in, in academia. You've seen in Oxford University, you've got Tariq Ramadan, uh, this image of a moderate Muslim, except that he doesn't really support very modern ve and very liberal uh, thoughts. So it, it's selling so, so much in Britain particularly. Um, why is that? Well, I mean, in relation to what I just talked about, that I'm using a pseudonym, now I'd, I'd probably be fine. A lot of people who speak openly in the, under their own name about Islam, you know, they don't get death threats, but there's a great many that do. I don't want to become one of them. Now, I think there's a, there's an, a very egregious double standard in evidence there, because you look, for instance, at somebody like Mehdi Hassan. Now, Mehdi Hassan actually says some reasonable things sometimes, and he's, you know, he is hailed as a, a moderate Muslim commentator. He's, a, he's an editor of the New Statesman. He writes for The Guardian. He's appeared on Question Time. He's a very high-profile commentator. This is a man, however, who is on record, and anybody can go on YouTube and search it, who is on record as describing non-Muslims as cattle. Right? You know, so there's, yeah, there's an yeah. example of the kind of double standards we're talking about. To give you another example, Luton has been a very fractious place with the relations between the Muslim and non-Muslim communities. Luton is where the, the English Defence League emerged. It's also where al Mahajirun, a now banned organization, emerged as well. If you look in somewhere like Luton, there is a Salafi imam by the name of Abdul Qadir Basque, who is on the, uh, the local council's Luton in Har Harmony community cohesion program. This is a man who's on record on local radio in Luton as saying that in his ideal Islamic state, homosexuals would be executed. This this is the kind of thing we're talking about. As you say, there's this idea of, you know, moderate Islam. I'm afraid that, in my opinion, in the, in the aftermath of 9-11, you know, in the Al-Qaeda attacks in America, we, we, we were sold this idea of moderate Muslims. Well, anybody who basically was ready to condemn, you know, terrorist attacks in the name of jihad was basically identified as a, a moderate, regardless of their opinions on non-Muslims, on gay rights, on uh, gender relations. On all manner of things, you know, you, it's, if, if there's you a were, if you were... picture in the UK which we could, you know, talk about in more depth. Yes, if you were offered a job just near Luton and you considered avoiding commute and living in Luton with your family and y young children, for instance, would you do it? Well, it's a good question. I think I'd be very careful about where I lived and I'd be pretty careful about where I sent my children to school. I can't profess to be an expert on a place like Luton, but, you know, you, you see and you hear enough in, in places like this to be very, very wary. I mean, you could take the example of Tower Hamlet in the east end of London. You know, we saw a, a Muslim mayor there, Lutfer Rachman, was, was uh, elected. He was later, very, fairly recently, thrown out for corruption. He had very, very well-documented links to the is Islamist far right, you know, the Islamic Forum for Europe, based in mm. the East London Mosque. He was elected there, and this was to the detriment of non-Muslims in the area, you know, the Jewish community and people like that. And mm. it's an area where we've seen a lot of violence against the gay community, people drinking mm. alcohol, even people running dating agencies and failing to observe the Ramadan fast. And in many cases, it's at the hands of self-proclaimed Sharia patrols. Now, these kind of things, I'm afraid to say, they make the wider population very, very wary about what the consequences could be in coming decades as, you know, with a high birth rate and with, you know, higher immigration continuing, mm -hmm. the Muslim population increases. Now, I want to say another thing. I've mentioned the way this is often, these kind of opinions I'm expressing are often equated with racism. I will say one thing here, and it's this. This really has very little, if anything, to do with race. This idea of Islamophobia, if we can call it that. And then, let, me, let me say something. Over two-thirds of the Muslims in Britain are of South Asian descent. Generally, they're either Pakistani, Bangladeshi, or Indian. There are you know, Somalis, there are Middle Eastern, there's Arabs. Mm -hmm. But by and large, so the average non-Asian Britain, with the exception of a Sikh man in a turban or a Muslim woman in a hijab or a niqab, 
Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs are more or less indistinguishable from one another on a superficial level. They're indistinguishable by and large. Mm. Yet the levels of integration and the wider perception of the latter two groups, the Hindus and the Sikhs, the two of the main South Asian you know, ethno-religious groups, they differ quite significantly, sadly, from that of the Muslim community. There are numerous reports on these particular groups, and I've got a lot of Sikh friends myself, mm. on their educational attainment, economic success, and basically staying on the right side of the law, staying out of jail, which showed that the Hindus and the Sikhs vastly outperform pretty much anybody else you could name, certainly the white majority in Britain. Mm -hmm. And they're, by and large, they're pretty well perceived by the majority of people. And as I said, I've got a lot so of... So are some and, Muslims, and say, in, in defense uh, of some Muslims, obviously, they are well-to-do people. Oh, abso absolutely, that's quite right. You know, you go to any, mm. you go to any general practitioner, you go course. to any hospital, you go to any law practice, you know, you will, you will find plenty of people, you'll find plenty of Muslims, you know, very well-integrated people who've, you know, very successful and they've, mm -hmm. they've done very well economically. And there, there obviously, there are many exceptions. But we cannot deny that there, there is a, a doctrine and a set of values which runs through the heart, certainly of, you know, mainstream Orthodox, certainly Sunni Islam, maybe Shia Islam as well. They're a much smaller, you know, demographic yes. in the UK, mm. which has been problematic, as I said. You know, it's, it's very interesting to Anthony, know that you know, South Asians are often more prone than the average white Britain to have concerns about the Muslim community, I'm sad to say, but sorry, yeah. Anthony, you wrote to us the Kurdish contrast, hypocrisy, yeah. selective outrage and anti-Semitism. Tell us more about this before we end this episode today. Well, uh, I would, make a, I would make a wider point on that, Carl, which is to say that, you know, I, 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 so, sadly, I think Muslims in Britain, they do themselves very few favours in the matters they choose to protest and condemn on a large scale and those they remain indifferent about. Maybe this is a crude contrast, but if we think back nine years to the Danish cartoon controversy, we saw three and a half thousand Muslims outside the Danish embassy in London. There were people holding placards bear, bearing slogans like, behead those who insult Islam. We saw the same, we saw the same in Beirut. The Mujahideen come roaring. Yeah, just, <laughs> just, just for a fact, we saw the same in Beirut, except they went to the wrong embassy. <laughs> they went to the uh, Dutch absolutely. embassy, it was a unfortunately. Thing. And of course, so. in other countries, people lost their lives in those protests. They, just, they turned into full-on riots. Now, Carry on. Yeah, and of course, we saw this earlier this year as well. You know, we saw over a thousand Muslims trampled all over the biggest war memorial in Britain, in the Cenotaph in the centre of London, in protest against the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. Now, it's very interesting to note, this was a month after the people responsible for those cartoons had been mown down in a hail of bullets in Paris by Al-Qaeda gunmen. So they weren't just protesting the cartoons, they were protesting a month after those, those who'd drawn the cartoons and published them had been killed. In the wake of 7-7, in the wake of the murder of Lee, Lee Rigby on London streets in Woolwich, in the wake of the Rotherham grooming scandal emerging last year, we saw no such protests, I'm afraid to say, nor do we see any large-scale expression of disgust when mm -hmm. fellow Sunni Muslims, in the name of Islam, citing Islamic scripture and tradition and jurisprudence in Syria and Iraq, they cite their justification from the scripture for massacring and sexually enslaving thousands of Yazidis and indeed Christians, executing and enslaving these people by the thousands. We see no mass protests. We saw no mass protest in the wake of 7-7. And as, as you alluded to, we can see a similar dichotomy and a double standard between the fact that there was almost universal outrage among British Muslims, mostly South Asian people with no linguistic or cultural ties to the, the Levant or, or the Middle East or, you know, the Arabic speakers, um, besides religion, over this almost universal outrage over Israel and in support of the Palestinian cause. And yet there's almost total silence over the Kurdish struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, these are people who've been subject to ethnic cleansing and periodical you know, warfare and genocides from Turkey, Syria, Iran and Iraq. And their fellow Christians, of course, over in the Kurdish Iraq. Cause. It, it, and it seems to me, if I may say, that I think the difference, if anything, is that it's not that Israel makes the mistake of marginalizing and oppressing Muslims, it's that it does so well as being a Jewish state, because the Kurds, like the Palestinians, are predominantly Sunni Muslim people who are, you know, stateless and oppressed. Mm. Thank you very much. Anthony Sykes uh, joined us from London. Thank you very much for your contribution. It's a pleasure to talk to you. As this rather sensitive discussion comes to an end, we do hope incitement of violence comes to an end too, here in Britain and the rest of the world. I'd like to thank all our guest speakers who joined us today, Mr. William Spring, Imran Shah from East London, and Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson from Los Angeles, Paul Perrin from Brighton, and Mr. Anthony Sykes from London. Stay tuned to Levant TV for more hopefully interesting discussions. Thanks for watching and bye for now.